Welcome everyone to Newton TV's presentation on respiratory inflammation and infection. We're excited to guide you through this important topic. Get ready to study smart with us as we delve into the complexities of respiratory health. Let's start with some epidemiology. The common cold is the most frequent respiratory infection we see. Pneumonia, on the other hand, poses a significant threat to older adults and those with weakened immune systems, with rhinovirus being a major culprit in about 40% of cold cases. Here's a look at the respiratory system. Understanding the anatomy from the larynx to the bronchioles is crucial. Note that the straight right bronchus makes the right middle and lower lobes more susceptible to aspiration. Remember the basics, the upper and lower respiratory tract functions, the anatomy of the lungs, and the vital transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Today, we'll be discussing the mucociliary apparatus, or MCA. This is a critical defense mechanism in our respiratory system. We'll explore its structure and how it functions to protect our lungs. Let's compare a healthy and unhealthy mucociliary escalator. In a healthy system, cilia efficiently remove microbes and debris. But when unhealthy, the escalator slows down, impairing clearance and increasing the risk of infection. Gas exchange is the cornerstone of respiration. Oxygen moves from the lungs into red blood cells, while carbon dioxide moves out. This vital process occurs in the alveoli, where oxygen binds to hemoglobin for transport throughout the body. Here's a closer look at gas exchange. Notice how oxygen enters the red blood cells and carbon dioxide exits. Remember, a pulse oximeter measures the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen, giving us a crucial insight into a patient's respiratory status. Now, Let's discuss the volume of oxygen dissolved in plasma and its relationship to PaO2. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is key to understanding how hemoglobin saturation is affected by PaO2 levels. When PaO2 falls below 60 mmHg, it can lead to tissue hypoxia. This graph illustrates the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Notice how shifts in the curve affect oxygen affinity and delivery to tissues. Understanding the causes and implications of left-shifted and right-shifted curves is essential for interpreting blood gas results. The diaphragm is a muscle innervated by the phrenic nerve at C4. A cord injury at or above C4 can eliminate respiratory control. When patients are short of breath, they often use external and internal intercostal muscles and sternocleidomastoids. Ventilation and perfusion are two distinct but interconnected processes. Ventilation refers to the inspiration and expiration of air, while perfusion is the movement of blood through the pulmonary circulation. Blood flows from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, which then branches into each lung, Let's dive into the ventilation perfusion ratio, or VQ. This ratio represents the balance between air and blood reaching the alveoli. An imbalance can lead to shunting or dead space, impacting gas exchange. Here's a visual representation of ventilation and perfusion imbalances. A poorly ventilated alveolus leads to a shunt, while an alveolus with no blood flow results in physiologic dead space. Understanding these concepts is crucial for diagnosing and managing respiratory conditions. Pulmonary embolism is a prime example of how interruptions to blood flow alter the VQ ratio. This can lead to significant respiratory compromise. Remember, maintaining adequate perfusion is just as important as ventilation. Hypoxia triggers pulmonary vasoconstriction. Over time, this can lead to chronic pulmonary vasoconstriction and ultimately pulmonary hypertension. Notice the difference between a normal heart and one affected by pulmonary hypertension. Hypoxia, or inadequate oxygen for cellular metabolism, presents with both early and late signs. 
Early signs include restlessness and tachycardia, while late signs include bradycardia and cyanosis. Pediatric patients may exhibit unique symptoms like feeding difficulty and nasal flaring. Breathing is controlled by central and peripheral chemoreceptors. Central chemoreceptors in the medulla sense, CO2 and blood pH. Peripheral chemoreceptors in the aortic arch and carotid bodies respond primarily to a decrease in arterial oxygen. This diagram illustrates the complex interplay of factors that control breathing, from the brain centers to the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. Multiple components work together to regulate respiration. Understanding this system is key to understanding respiratory dysfunction. The normal stimulus to breathe is hypercapnia, or increased CO2 in the blood. However, long-term exposure to hypercapnia can decrease the response of central chemoreceptors, leading to a reliance on peripheral chemoreceptors and low O2 as the primary stimulus. Let's cover some respiratory dysfunction basics. Dyspnea, or shortness of breath, is a common sign. Cough can be caused by various factors, and its characteristics, such as whether it's productive or non-productive, can provide valuable clues. Here are some more basics. Hemoptysis is coughing up blood, and it's important to differentiate between blood in sputum and GI vomit. Atelectasis is the collapse of alveoli, often seen post-operatively. Hypoxia refers to a lack of sufficient oxygen, and carbon monoxide can cause it by binding to hemoglobin. Impending respiratory failure is a critical concern. Hypoxemia and hypercapnia are key indicators. Serial arterial blood gases are essential for monitoring patients at risk. Assessment and examination are crucial for diagnosing respiratory conditions. This includes taking a thorough history, using the old cart mnemonic, and performing a physical exam with inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. The diagram shows a specific pattern for examination. This diagram summarizes the causes, symptoms, and treatments for hypoxia. From risk factors to clinical manifestations and nursing interventions, this provides a comprehensive overview of this critical condition. Auscultation involves listening for normal and adventitious lung sounds. Adventitious sounds like crackles, wheezes, and raunchy can indicate various respiratory problems. Vocal resonance, bronchophony, egophony, and whispered pectoriloquy can also provide valuable diagnostic information. Various diagnostic procedures are used to assess respiratory function. These include ABGs, culture and sensitivity tests, sputum samples, pulse oximetry, imaging, bronchoscopy, and thoracentesis. Remember the normal values for pH, PCO2, HCO3, PO2, and O2 saturation. Pulmonary function tests, or PFTs, are used to measure lung volume and airflow. Spirometry is a common type of PFT. These tests can help diagnose and monitor respiratory conditions. Treatment options for respiratory disorders are varied. Bronchodilators, antibiotics, thrombolytics, decongestants, antihistamines, antitussives, saltwater gargles, antivirals, and pulmonary hygiene are all potential interventions. Avoid weakening cough. Let's move on to upper respiratory tract disorders, starting with pharyngitis. This is inflammation of the pharynx. It's often viral, but it's important to rule out gaps or strep. If enlarged cervical nodes are present, consider checking for Epstein-Barr virus or mono. Epiglottitis is a serious upper respiratory tract disorder. It's an infection and inflammation of the epiglottis that can lead to airway obstruction. Signs and symptoms include drooling, difficulty breathing, and inspiratory stridor. Treatment focuses on comfort, avoiding throat exams, and having a tract tray or endotracheal tube available. Acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, or croup, is another upper respiratory tract disorder. It's characterized by a barking cough and inspiratory stridor. It commonly occurs in children aged 3 months to 3 years. 
Now let's discuss lower respiratory tract disorders, starting with acute bronchitis. This involves inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles. It can be caused by bacteria, viruses, or toxins. Pneumonia is an inflammation of lung tissue where alveolar air spaces fill with inflammatory cells and fibrin. It can be bacterial, viral, or due to aspiration. Influenza infection is a major risk factor. Here's a visual representation of pneumonia. Notice the difference between normal alveoli and alveoli affected by pneumonia. Understanding the pathophysiology of pneumonia is crucial for effective management. Community-acquired pneumonia, or CAPI, is an acute infection of the lung parenchyma acquired outside the hospital. Symptoms include fever, cough, sputum production, and pleuritic chest pain. Streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of typical CAPI. This Venn diagram compares the symptoms of bronchitis and pneumonia. While some symptoms overlap, others are more specific to each condition. This can help differentiate between the two. Tuberculosis, or TB, is a lower respiratory tract disorder. It's most common in the lungs but can affect other parts of the body. It's important to distinguish between TB disease and latent TB infection, as both require treatment. This infographic provides a comprehensive overview of tuberculosis. From transmission to symptoms and treatment, this visual aid can help reinforce key concepts. Active TB disease presents with various symptoms. The Mantu tuberculin skin test is used to detect TB infection. Understanding the diagnostic and clinical features of TB is essential for effective management. Here is a comparison of latent TB and TB disease. Latent TB is inactive and non-infectious while TB disease is active and can spread. Antimicrobials are required to treat TB, and respiratory isolation is necessary. Thank you for watching this Newton TV presentation. We hope you found it informative and helpful. Please subscribe, like, and share to support our mission of providing quality medical education. Remember to study smart.